to Ohio. My name is uh, David Pirro, and I, as Yannick already introduced, I'm coming from Graz together with my colleague Hans Holgerutz. Um, I'm part of the research team of the ALMAT research project, which is based at the IEM in Graz. And I am part also of uh, our duo uh, that performed yesterday, uh, Anemone Actinaria. And today I will try to um, explain a little bit uh, how I played yesterday, and what systems I used yesterday in the concert, and, and also on, the, on that basis try to um, elucidate or, or uh, enlighten, put shed light on how, what I'm interested in in working in with algorithms and how I find the work with algorithms uh, interesting. Um, so when thinking, when coming here to, to, to Kasper, uh, I was thinking how I would uh, try to unpack uh, my system in order to present it to you, how I would formulate it uh, in, in some way that it's uh, somehow uh, graspable. And I, unfortunately, I came up with this thing here. <laughs> um, I guess I used it, I used mathematics because I have a background in physics, in theoretical physics, so it's sometimes, it's, it's natural to use it. Um, I guess that it's not, for everyone, uh, uh, clear uh, what what this thing means. Um, that doesn't matter. Um, I will explain it to you a little bit in in, uh, in shortly. Um, what you see here is a set of um, differential equations, um, first order differential equations, first order nonlinear differential equations. They have very much in common to what you. <laughs> Uh, presented before, we didn't we didn't uh, speak before, so it's it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, uh, the the number is a little bit different. I'm using uh, three sets, which are marked with this uh, uh, letters X, Y, and Z. Three sets of uh, systems. Uh, each system has uh, 21 times two. Uh, dimensions, I would say, so 21 times two equations. 21 because I used 21 loudspeakers in the uh, ZKM uh, dome. So in our performance yesterday, Hans Holger and me, we uh, brotherly shared the uh, loudspeakers in the dome. Each one take, uh, each of us took 21 of those. So we interleaved um, our outputs. So you see in this set of equations, there's, there are a set of uh, different um, coefficients, functions. Um, there is this HH function, which is the Hans Holger function. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is. It represents the sample input, audio sample input coming from uh, Hans Holger's system. So that plays a role also in this in this uh, system, and there are these uh, these parameters here: this f, uh, x, y, and z, a, uh, x, y, and z, b, c, e, and d. And this I control in real time. This is what these are the parameters I control when playing, when we play together. Um, the temporal evolution of the sum of um, x1, epsilon1, and z1 of each of these uh, three sets is then sent, basically audified, uh, is then sent directly to one loudspeaker. Okay. So I deal with dynamical systems in probably for, for very similar reasons uh, to uh, you, you introduced before, Tom. I come also from a, a research in interaction. Um, I'm fascinated uh, by the possibilities of uh, interactivity that are offered by those systems that are nonlinear and therefore uh, uh, require and afford a different kind of uh, contact 
by the uh, by the, the by the user, so to say, if you want to speak of users, or by the performer, and this is very interesting. And I. And I'm in general very interested in the possibilities they offer for structuring time. Dynamical systems, which is, this is a dynamical system, they structure time. Dynamical systems live in time. And this is a very interesting thing to me, how a set of rules can generate a very fixed set of rules, which is a fixed set of rules, uh, can generate uh, completely different behavior in time and structure time in, in very different ways. I point out that there is no further specialization algorithms uh, involved here, so the space you would hear resulting, the sonic space, uh, you would hear resulting from the evolution of this system comes from the Space, from the space in the system itself. So these, all these uh, parameters here, x, y, and z, are space, so, uh, sort of coordinates. Um, and what you would hear is this evolution of the phase space, one would say, um, well, phase trajectory, uh, one would say, in, in of this system. So there is no in-between um, specialization algorithm used here. So I'm, I'm, when I look at this, I ask myself, is this what we heard, what we hear? Is it what we heard yesterday? And I would like to say not actually, right? We don't hear equations. We hear behavior. We hear time structure. This is, we have a very, humans have a very strong uh, perception of temporal, um, temporal behavior, temporal changes. Um, we maybe are able to have a glimpse of what, uh, what kind of, that there is a coherent behavior uh, uh, behind what we hear or what we see, uh, but we are not, so we, we do reconstruct in some way the equations behind uh, some process, but we are not hearing equations. We are hearing phenomena that are in time. So what did we hear yesterday? I can try to uh, formulated a little bit differently. This is what you're seeing here. What you're seeing here is you know, because this, yeah. this very first two terms, you see that the equations are very are coupled some way. This very first term here is an oscillator, is a nonlinear oscillator. The second term here expresses that each oscillator is interacting and connected to the next one, the next ETH index. So the one on the left side, if you want to picture it, uh, especially in the one on the, on, the, on the right, from the right side. So it's a chain of oscillators. It's a cyclic, say, a chain. Further, here we have other terms. And these terms also express that there is an interaction. This time the interaction is between these three different layers. Each of the, each oscillator on each layer interacts and is influenced by the oscillator on the other layer. This is the um, influence I get from Hans Holger's output. And this here is expresses the tendency of a system to uh, lose energies, to say it's a kind of an attrition uh, term. So putting uh, D to a high volume would uh, decrease the energy in a system. So it's a tendency to the system to go to zero, basically. Um, so, is this what we hear here and what we heard yesterday is a set of interacting uh, in training in some way you heard you also used that system uh, that word um, oscillators um, I'm not sure I would say yes and no um, for explaining what I mean I have to make a big jump now and I would play 
a short thing. I play it live, hopefully. What I what is this? What I just showed to you is a reenactment of a very famous um, experiment. Uh, it's the so-called Fermi Pasta Ulam experiment, which is historically very one of the very first um, numerical experiments. Um, it is. Uh, it has been done in 1953, I think the paper is 1954. Um, it's Fermi. Um, it was then on the so-called MANIAC, which it was a computer at the time, which stands for Mathematical Analyzer, Numerical Integrator and Computer, and has a wonderful name, uh, and was standing at Los, Alas at, uh, Los Alamos at the time. Why I'm showing this to you? Because, well, personally, it's part of my history. It's the very first system I ever programmed in Fortran. Um, and why is this interesting? Um, I won't go too much into detail of the experiment itself. It should be enough to say that what they was trying to, to do is to take the equation of a vibrating string composed by different masses. These masses inter are interconnected by forces that resemble uh, spring forces, actually the very first very exact spring forces, and then which is the very first law that you see here, and then introduce a very small perturbation here. 
in a quadratic term. And then also there is a cubic uh, perturbation. This is what I did now in real time, as I introduced this perturbation. What happens is something they could not know beforehand and could not expect beforehand. Um, this was not only one of the very first computational experiments, which is also already interesting, but it was the very first mathematical experiments um, in which chaos or the chaos theory appeared. Uh, was very f one of the very first experiments on nonlinear dynamics, which is a theme that is one of the most prominent research teams, uh, teams and fields also nowadays. Um, so it is recognized as one of the birth places, birth points of chaos theory. And because it is uh, one of the very first computational experiments, you have to think that at this, from starting from this point in physics, there was a third way for doing physics. There was near theoretical physics and experimental physics that was, there was computational physics, the so-called third way. So it's a method. It, it's, a, it's a way of doing physics that is different from the standard inductive and deductive uh, methods that were used in physics uh, until there. This was the, one of the birthplaces of computational science at, in, at, at large. And, um, and of course, there was a great interest in, in showing in, in uh, uh, research in this kind of uh, nonlinear. Uh, phenomena because you have to think our world is basically non-linear. Uh, any kind of phenomena we are dealing with, say be it a symbol or uh, any, uh, any instrument we are dealing with, it's non-linear. And the problem is that we don't have the mathematics to understand these problems. We cannot solve them. Any other problem, any other linear problem, you can Try, we can find a solution, a mathematical solution that describes the behavior of that system at any time, in future, in past. Um, you, can, you choose it, you get it. For this kind of systems, you can't. We don't have the mathematics to do that. Yeah? And that's because this kind of system are extremely interesting, um, because we don't know how to approach them. And yet they are part, an integral part of our whole uh, world. Um, I report of this, uh, of this uh, experiment here because I think that there is a very specific way of dealing with algorithms they used here, which I think is interesting for all of us. And I think it's an approach and, and a, a stance towards algorithmic experiment that uh, is still very, act uh, very contemporary. Um, so we don't have the mathematics to deal with this kind of system. What you do? You compute the system each time frame after time frame. So you take a starting point and you see, OK, I, let's take a, an approximate step, very small step into the next time, let's see where the system is, and then let's re pay, play, uh, take this state, put it in again into our algorithm, compute the next step, and let's go on like this. This, is, this process is called numerical integration. And it's not a uh, mathematical solution to that, but it gives you an approximate uh, idea of how such system might behave. Numerical integration is uh, also what uh, Tom Mudd uh, uses, I, I guess, <laughs> um, uh, in his, uh, in his uh, works and what I use for, um, for driving my, my systems. So it's a specific way of uh, extracting behavior or temporal behavior of, from a nonlinear system. Otherwise, you couldn't be able to do that. 
So, on, so the only possibility to study this kind of problems is to simulate it. And this process is a process that lives in, that is temporal. It needs time. The, all this uh, numerical integration algorithms, they compute time, but also take time. Every step of this algorithm has a specific time step. And it, that is repeated all over and over again. And there is no univoc solution to which this kind of algorithm converges. It just runs. The, what the algorithm produces is a set of observations, basically, um, from which then the observer extracts or tries to extract some law. Right? The, the plot you showed before, uh, it's a very good plot. Um, uh, from the Duffing equation, where these regions have, have drawn, uh, were drawn where chaos is to be uh, found uh, with some specific parameters. They are produced exactly like this. The, you run the system a hundred million times with slightly different parameters and try to understand how it behaves and then put a mark there. There is no other way to do this. <laughs> uh, I found this fascinating because you don't you, you have to go with the system in order to understand it. You have to consume your time uh, in, in, in looking at what it does, um, computing every step in order to understand slightly what it might do. So this is, of course, a very extreme case, but um, every algorithm has this characteristic. Every algorithm lives in time. Every algorithm takes time to, to, uh, to, um, uh, to perform and to evolve. Each state of the argument leaves a mark. In this case, uh, in my case, this mark is a sample. When you join all the marks together, you get a sound wave, <coughs> and that sound wave gives you a hint on how to reconstruct perceptually reconstruct the behavior of the system. Um, we'll play a short, very short. This uh, audio and video was produced using uh, one of those layers that you've seen before. So it's um, a static fixed media piece in this case, so not interactive, uh, leaving one, uh, one of those layers go on with uh, set parameters. And this is a, a visualization I came up with in order to have a glimpse of what this swirl and coordinates and, and uh, coupled oscillator do in, in real time. Um, there is another uh, important aspect of the fermi pasta ulam experiment I want to point out. Um, there is no correlate of what they uh, simulated in the real world. And it was not their wish to simulate something that is real, OK? The, 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 the uh, Fermi-Pasta-Ulam system is a completely theoretical 
system. They wouldn't try to adapt their system in order to fit something that they would observe in the real world. So it's a complete speculation. Okay? It's when we always, when we think of uh, 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 computer simulation, we think of simulation of aircrafts, air flows around an aircraft, or uh, simulating a clarinet, or uh, similar things, or a violin. Um, in that case, uh, the system they simulated there was not existing. It, it was a theoretical system. It was a purely speculative act there. They, they, they were doing there. They were just trying, we can do this now with this computer. Let's try this. We didn't do it before. Let's try what, what it does. And it's speculative in the sense here is, uh, in the sense I use it here, is like putting a mark somewhere and then trying to understand if you can get back from that mark into a known region of knowledge you share. So it's, de it's, it's different on standard deductive and inductive techniques and when you stand on, on uh, gained knowledge, uh, gained um, ex uh, experience, and from that you go forward to somewhere um, departing from there. A speculative act is I put something there in a dark region and try to come back to it, re-thread it, re-thread the path back. And this is because I found this even more interesting. <laughs> um, and this speculative attitude is something uh, not new in the history of science. Uh, it can be traced back to a very long tradition in physics, uh, at least in physics, uh, probably there is in mathematics also, uh, or in other sciences too. And it's the tradition of the thought experiment. Okay? The thought experiment is um, a scientist that uses a safe place, a safe place is his or her imagination, to wildly put some hypothesis into, uh, into, the, uh, into the field and try to understand if that makes sense, okay? And I think that computer uh, experiments, numerical experiments started from exactly this, uh, if you want a radical uh, way of seeing and doing experiments, okay? And this, in this attitude, I think it has been um, lost in some way, especially in many uh, applications uh, we see today where technology-driven, uh, solution-driven, uh, uh, perspectives are employed all over the place um, in which technological narratives have been um, burying this very radical uh, experimental attitude uh, under layers of um, false expectations. Um, what is, all, what is interesting, the Fermi Pasta Ulam experiment, that I would like to, to uh, enhance also in my, my uh, practice is um, algorithms are not used in an instrumental way. They're used for exploring. The state in which you try to get into is a very um, liminal state. So you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> You don't know, you don't simulate something that you, that is else with respect to what you are doing. Um, there is no start and end point of your simulation. Why end at a certain point? There is no solution. You can leave it going on. You have to choose where to end it. So these algorithms are in a very strange state. They're in a, in a I would call it a, a, a liminal state between something that is not yet to be interpreted, there is something uh, that has to be observed before getting to some conclusions or to some um, 
onto some uh, observations. And something that is still very speculative. And this speculative potential is something that I'm missing most of the time in all, uh, in many, many, uh, many approaches to algorithms, especially in our computer music field. So, um, I would like to advocate for a, uh, let's say, change um, towards a more experimental attitude to, towards algorithmic processes um, then that would allow for procrastinating uh, solutions and lingering in this liminal state a little bit longer, in which things are not yet said, not intended, which things do not stand for something other, and symbols do not pr in, for, for symbols and do not represent a source, a position of a sound field, but are just the, the evolution of a, um, an algorithm in time and leave the performer and the uh, perceiver the duties to reconstruct it and not give them already a label to, uh, to uh, uh, with which to understand what they hear and what they see. So freeing the performer from the duties of delivering a symbol and the receiver from its duty of accepting and understanding that symbol. Um, I guess I'm already two minutes over, so I will stop here. And I hope I confused you well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, David Peru, uh, for the insights he shared. Are there questions coming from the audience? I'd like to come back to this uh, Fermi pasta experiment. Mm -hmm. and there are, uh, two, in, in my knowledge, there are two uh, approaches to solve differential equations. One is the digital way and one the analog way. Were there any comparisons between yeah, those? Yes, the, the digital way is not a solution. Mm, the yes. digital way <laughs> is <laughs> the analog way would be a solution. Mm. Uh, the digital way is not a solution. It's 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 a simulation, and it's an, a very approximate simulation. Mm. And that is also because I I would not like to say that what I was playing with is a set of coupled oscillators because a set of coupled oscillators they they do not exist in the digital world. Mm. I just integrate. Using the, the numerical the, thing exactly um, uh, gives the cows exactly. <laughs> okay. Who would like to ask the next question? I would uh, like to ask uh, an algorithm without its instrumentality. Is it still an algorithm or is it something else? <coughs> um. I, I, it depends how you how you stand toward it. For, for me, yes. But for me, an, an algorithm that is an instrument that is used as an instrument is an instrument. Uh, it's less an algorithm. Um, and but it, I, I guess it's uh, what I'm what I was talking here is it was it was trying to. Um, Elucidated, it, it's it's there. There are different ways to um, to interact with algorithms. There are ways to interact with algorithms in which you see algorithms as tools, as instruments, which is perfectly fine. It's it's not it's not forbidden and it's not wrong. Uh, but there are other ways, and in which you don't expect of a solution. You don't expect to get to a point. Uh, which you already actually uh, pre, uh, preconceived before, right? Um, and you interact with this process in a different way, which is then non-instrumental. Uh, 
Are there some more questions? You don't need to be so shy. Okay. All right, it <laughs> seems as if you explained everything perfectly. Oh, there is a question by Rutger Brummer. <laughs> I, I, I doubt it. <laughs> Maybe it was uh, mentioned already somehow, but uh, uh, your approach uh, or your, your intention, your claim, um, <clears throat> what should happen? Uh, so, Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I guess what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to do is to spoil uh, to to um, get rid of all kinds of preconceptions that are floating around algorithms. So if you take this kind, uh, this uh, algorithm, for example, the um, yeah this algorithm, and you start to say, well, this is not really this mathematical formulation. Sorry, this is not really this. Uh, um, uh, coupled oscillators. So, what the end, at the end, what 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 what's left? And I think that's a very interesting point to get because at the end you just get a bunch of multiplications and additions that are run all and over again. And the marvelous thing for me is that this iterative. Um, um, uh, process has an extremely strong perceptual uh, resonance. And this is what I am interested in. How come that these things have such great uh, perceptual resonances? Even if we don't if we forget where, we, where they get from, where they come from, and where, how, uh, how we get there, these uh, processes are aesthetic processes in themselves. You don't need anything else, okay? And when you get to this point, then you, un you, you realize how many things there are there that you can uh, then put them back in. So there are the expectations of the scientists that led to that operations. There, there are possibilities of the technologies that led to that kind of specific implementation of operations that are the expectation of the public uh, of, uh, or the, your possibilities as a, as a programmer or um, all these kind of things. All these kind of things suddenly become part, are part of an entangled object that is an algorithm. And getting to understand that, crit that these algorithms are critical objects that are not so easily instrumentalized, um, but rather are themselves a, ne a complex network or nonlinear interrelations. This is what interests me. I don't know if I. All right, there's one last question. We saw the different results with graphics. Are there similar results with acoustics? Sorry? Are there similar results with acoustic outputs? Um, uh, this ones, maybe. Um, yeah, in a way. I mean, what you see here is. Ah, oh, you you uh, you muted it. Yeah. Um, it's just the the changes in the movement of this. Uh, dimensions I, I've, I've told yeah. you before, yeah. of course, massively under, uh, under sampled, but yeah. it's the same time frame. So I, I take a few of, uh, of those frames that are at the same time uh, producing the sound that you would hear mm -hmm. um, and draw a, and draw this, this, yeah. this graphic. So they, there, is a, there is a direct relationship. Then the question is, what is the time axis then, if it, it transfers into sound? It, uh, the time axis is. I don't get the question. <laughs> yeah. They're two dimensional. Ah, plots. this one. Ah, yeah. sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, 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 these are these two dimensions. Yeah. One two and two. Dimensions. Yeah. One and two. So yeah. this, these two yeah. are for each of these uh, elements. One could be the time. Well, the time is here. The time is here, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Okay. So it's just the evolution of each of these yes. two couple, coupled uh, uh, dimensions. Yeah. Okay. That means it, it, it could be applied either by, by graphic or by sound. Exactly, yes. Okay, thank you. All right. Now these were three questions. So uh, thank you very much, David Piro. Now everything became really clear. <laughs>